there, listeners. This is Tech Policy Grind, the show where we hammer out the latest in tech law and policy with the folks at the forefront of that space. And today we have such a treat for you. Let's be honest. If you're listening to this show, you've almost certainly already read her work over on Gizmodo. Her incredible articles on the pregnancy panopticon, how your smart home can spy on you, and recently what it's like and whether it's possible to block the big five tech companies from your life are some of, if not the best pieces of journalism out there on consumer technology privacy issues. Our guest today is, of course, Kashmir Hill, senior writer at Gizmodo Media Group's Special Projects Desk and a self-described canary in the coal mine for bad consumer technology privacy issues. This week, we get to talk about lessons she learned from blocking the Big Five, the state of consumer privacy protections in the U.S., and her journey from blogging at Above the Law to writing with an investigative team at Gizmodo, where she gets to spend months working on fascinating issues. My name is Emery Roan. This is still a podcast from the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, and we are so glad to bring you along with us. And good news. Applications are currently open for the next class of fellows at the ILPF. Foundry fellows are early career professionals and students who set the strategy and run the operations of the Foundry. And they do cool projects, like this podcast that you're listening to right now. I've had awesome opportunities and met incredible colleagues through the Foundry. Applications are open until April 30th, so go check it out and submit yours at ilpfoundry.us slash join. You can follow the show on Twitter at Tech Policy Grind, and you can find me on Twitter at Emery Roan. So, with the introductions behind us, let's start the show. All right, then let's just get started. Kashmir Hill is joining us today. Kashmir, thank you so much for joining us. Kashmir is a senior writer at Gizmodo and author of some of, if not, I think, the best writing on consumer privacy technology issues out there. Uh, Kashmir, thank you so much for being here. It's a real pleasure to have you. My pleasure to be here. So uh, I am a little nervous, honestly, <laughs> about getting into this because I'm such a huge fanboy. Um, Joe and I both work in consumer privacy on the nonprofit side of the world, trying to get people to care about privacy law and trying to get better privacy laws out there. Um, and then you come around here and just multiple times a year drop these incredible pieces that just like get incredible coverage and open everyone's eyes to how terrible the world is. Um, and everyone in our side of the world just spends like the next week talking about your articles. Um, so I think the biggest one this year has to be the six part series blocking the big five that you wrote about earlier in February. That was, um, a piece that took uh, how, how many weeks? I, I think the si six weeks or more for you to create. Yeah, it so. was a long, it was a quite a time machine because I started the series, uh, I started planning it last summer, actually, like figured out how to build this uh, tool that would keep my devices from being able to actually talk to the tech giant. So I worked on that with the technologist Drew Marotra for a while and then started in late October, you know, had the lived experience over with by the, by the time Christmas rolled around and then, you know, actually started publishing them in, I think started in January and finished in February. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, a long, a long, a long birth process. <laughs> yeah. Uh, during that time, uh, or rather, um, during that time you, you had, you didn't have the child while you were doing that reporting, but I do remember one of the best pieces of the article was, uh, starting off talking about Amazon and how much your daughter, uh, regretted not being able to shout to Alexa for help anymore. Yeah, there was, it was funny because there was a period kind of around Halloween when she learned the concept of scary and creepy. She's, oh. you know, she, she was one at the time where she kept saying that Alexa is scary. And I was like, well, what, <laughs> like, why would she think Alexa is scary? And then and I also, realized, can you well, please say it in front of the microphone because that is like the perfect <laughs> bit for the story. <laughs> but it is this like disembodied creature that's always there when you say its name. Like, I, I can understand why she would find that concept terrifying. But then, <laughs> When, but then when Alexa was actually gone, yeah, there was a lot of crying, especially because it wasn't just the Echo that disappeared when I blocked Amazon. It was uh, basically all TV for us um, because Amazon Web Services powers, you know, Netflix and HBO Go and basically all streaming video that we consumed. So it meant she wasn't able to watch her favorite movies either. How long did it take for her to get over that? I mean, I, I, I thought it was fascinating was by the end you had sort of found, I almost feel like some sort of tranquility, like a different sense of time. And like you seem to be enjoyed going outside more. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. How did it impact your daughter, if I may ask? Yeah, I mean, these are easy things, right? Like, it's so nice just to be able to set up a movie for her when we want to, when my husband and I want to, like, play a great game of cribbage or make dinner or something like that. Um, and and she does, she, like, loves, you know, watching Coco, and now it's Wally. She's obsessed with Wally. <laughs> it's um, a good movie to be obsessed about. <laughs> but I would, I do, I mean, it's hard to, to judge these things, right? It's so subjective. But I felt that ultimately she is happier and in a, a better mood there's like fewer tantrums when we're just interacting with her and reading a book or playing a game um yeah i just i uh so so it made things like a little harder because it meant like hey i've got to be totally focused on my daughter um but i think everybody was happier about it in the end um again that's my subjective read can I ask, how do you find inspiration for this? So it's fascinating that you started playing this last summer. But I mean, as again, I think both Emery and I are longtime fans of your reporting. Going back to stuff like uh, when you, I think you wired up your house and turned it into like a house that spied on you. Um, and your work with EFF on the pregnancy panopticon. Um, you know, what's your process for generating these stories? Well, here, I'll try to do it very quick. Well, when I, um, you know, I did this story many years ago. Um, it was really just blogging a New York Times story, but it was about um, about how Target was data mining to try to figure out which of its customers were pregnant. And um, it was a big New York Times piece. I did a, I did a small blog about it, but my blog really blew up because I, I, I think the title was something like how Target figured out a teen girl was pregnant before her father did. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've all read it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone brings it up at every privacy conference. You know that Target once figured out that a girl was pregnant by. Yeah. It was the, it was the privacy big no like free space for a long time. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't my story. I did help popularize it. And I still wonder to this day if it's true. Just because huh. like that, the, the teen girl has never come forward. The father's never come forward. It was kind of like a, a you know, a, a target executive told Charles Duhigg of the New York Times that story. And so it's huh. kind of like a path down the grapevine type story where sometimes I wonder if it's true. But um, uh, but anyways, I did that story. And around that time, you know, I did a lot of research into how companies want to know who's pregnant because they know that those people are going to spend a lot of money on predictable things. And so when I myself got pregnant, I was like, oh, I wonder who's going to be trying to figure out that I'm pregnant. And I decided one way would be, um, hey, I'll use all of these, you know, fertility and pregnancy tracking apps and try to see where the data goes. And so I wanted, I, lo I love working with technologists because I think there's so much that they bring to stories. So I partnered with um, EFF technologist Cooper Quinton and we devised a way to, you know, um, I also used a tool from um, university, uh, Northeastern University, some researchers there led by David Chofneys. And so we are capturing the data that was leaving my phone and then trying to track it. So that's where that, that story idea came from. The smart home story came from uh, another technologist I worked with, Surya Matu, and I were talking about how the FCC had p passed that rule saying that internet service providers, you know, couldn't data mine people. Um, and uh, when Trump administration came into being, the FCC reversed itself on that rule and said, hey, no, ISPs don't have to respect your privacy. And we were trying to figure out, like, how do we get people to to care about this policy uh, reversal that happened. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe we should show people exactly what the ISPs could theoretically see. But we felt like people already knew that about phones and computers. So we thought, oh, let's let's make, let's build a smart home and show what the ISP could see about a smart home. And then that story, you know, evolved way beyond that. But that's that's where that came from. And then this one was actually pitched to me by somebody who, um, uh, uh, by kind of like a, you know, there's a lot of Google critic groups out there. And one of them was like, hey, you should try to block Google from your life because it's really, really hard. And I was like, oh, that's actually a great idea, but I want to do it with all the technology giants. Um, and so, yeah, I'm always just looking for story ideas. And I definitely love first person stories when I can do them because I think you, it, it makes it even easier to bring the human angle to the technology story um, that's so important to get people to care about these things. Yeah, I mean, the, the blocking the big five, the pregnancy panopticon, those are like incredibly, like almost viscerally impactful. Like everyone reading that, I feel like, you know, immediately understands the importance of those issues. Um, to, on the big five, actually, you know, to the issue of like, it, you know, it's really hard to block Google. I, I think, you know, 
you blocked the big five, including Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, uh, Google, and Amazon. But really, the the most difficult ones to block had to be Amazon and Google, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were. Um, they're just woven into the fabric of the internet in a way where it was impossible to avoid them. And it took down so many other services um, when I, when I blocked those. So those were, yeah, on the live side, those were definitely the two, the two hardest ones. Amazon kept breaking through the blockade um, (laughs) (laughs) three distinct ways. I mean, one was like my husband went to get us lunch one day and came back with sushi from Whole Foods and I was eating it before I remembered that Amazon had bought Whole Foods. Um, (laughs) I ordered, you know, I wasn't using, I, I use amazon.com a lot, especially since my daughter was born. It's just so much easier to order various things and it's just harder to go to a store than it used to be. Um, But I wasn't using Amazon.com and we need to order this little like phone holder for the car. So I turned to eBay. But then when the the phone holder came, it was in an Amazon package because the eBay seller relied on Amazon to store um, his product and to ship it. So I was, you know, using Amazon even when I was using its theoretical um, competitor, eBay. And well, then... I loved when you needed to when you needed to try to send a file, a recording for an interview. You tried to use Onion Share, but it turns out that Onion Share was itself hosted on Amazon Web Services, right? Yeah, not the <laughs> not the actual service, but their website. Okay. So I couldn't, yeah, I oh. couldn't download it. I had to like use command line language um, with my Linux in order to to download it directly from uh, the server of the developer. Um, but the last time, the last thing that was hard about Amazon is that we couldn't actually totally block Amazon Web Services just because of the way the internet works. Um, our, you know, my, my, my blocker was kind of like a crude beast that was blocking IP addresses, IP ranges that we knew were operated by various tech giants. And the problem with website hosting is that sometimes there will be a site that's hosted by Amazon Web Services, but then they'll have another service in front of it um, called a cloud delivery network that just like makes sure the website loads faster. Um, I kind of thought of it as like Amazon uh, Web Services is the warehouse where all the data is. And then the cloud delivery networks are like little storefronts. um, And uh, they store some of the data so it can get to your your computer faster instead of coming all the way from the warehouse. So if one of these... um, uh, CDNs, they're called, was in front, was was being used by a website. I couldn't, we couldn't see that AWS was behind it. So there were some sites that were slipping through my block, including Gizmodo itself. Um, mm. I was like, oh, good, Gizmodo works. And then I asked our tech people what we use to host, and they're like, oh, Amazon Web Services, and <laughs> we use Fastly as the as the cloud delivery network. And my my question is, it seemed like the the stories actually just raised more questions. Um, you know, your, your follow-up where you started discussing like the, the relationship between um, Amazon and Chase with their rewards card and how KG might be too cynical a way to describe it, but like the unclear answers about what exactly was going on. Yeah, I just, um, you know, to start the experiment, I wanted to look at, well, what Amazon services are am, am I using? And there were a lot, like we have Kindles in our house, we have the Echo, we had the Echo Dot, we have, you know, Amazon Prime Video on our TV. And then my husband and I both have Amazon Prime accounts and Amazon Prime credit cards from Visa. And so I was just like, oh, I want, obviously I'll stop using this, but I wonder what data Amazon gets about me because I use this card. And Amazon and Chase, they just were so evasive. They just would not give me a straight answer. Um, and it was very frustrating uh, because it just seems like a very simple thing to answer. And it's, yeah, probably yet another story about what happens to your credit card data. This is something Apple just launched this new credit card uh, with Goldman Sachs. And they said, oh, okay, we're not going to sell your data. And one thing that became clear to me as I was doing some research for that Amazon Chase credit card story was that Every, uh, yeah, there's just a lot that's happening behind the scenes with sale of credit card information that's, you know, anonym, uh, anonymized and it, Right, aggregated. right. Always anonymized. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, and I, what I also just always find, uh, you, you highlight these issues that can sort of percolate for years. Like you were doing all sorts of reporting about Facebook's people uh, you may know feature. And then, of course, you know, as we've had sort of the past year of Facebook privacy, pro- privacy troubles, um, it's sort of like, 
put all the puzzle pieces together uh, as to what you were originally worried about, I think, right? Yeah, I think I'm a good canary in the coal mine. <laughs> <laughs> privacy Absolutely. coal mine. Yeah. Can I uh, get your thoughts? Then? I mean, for, as a privacy canary, you know, this, I think the, the, the conclusion from the big five is, you know, is, is this like, a, like a, an area where we need better privacy laws or is this an area where we need better antitrust enforcement uh, or is this an area where we need both? And I, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are as someone that's, you know, written about consumer privacy issues like this. I'll take A and B, Emory. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, we basically don't have privacy laws in the United States is, is one big problem. Um, uh, I mean, they're so limited and it's state by state. Um, and when it comes to, I mean, uh, there are privacy laws and some states are, they're stronger than others, but uh, it kind of boils down to on a national level, if it's in the privacy policy, they can do it. Um, and that, it, that just gives us so little protection. Um, and there's, there's just no visibility into what is happening with our data on the back end. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, that's something I've been trying to get at for really a decade now. It's just that no one totally understands how the data broker system works and who knows what about them. Um, and so hmm. my hope is that we do get kind of like more laws like the one that passed in California that are supposed to give consumers more rights to request to see what a company knows about them and ask to delete data or ask them to stop selling it. You know, more of like the, in Europe, you have, they have the right to access. Like they can ask any company, what data do you have on me? And then those companies are supposed to, to send it to them. Um, and we just don't have that in the United States. So yeah, I would certainly love to see more privacy rights, um, consumer privacy rights. Uh, and on the antitrust side, I mean, this was, pretty new to me. Um, it wasn't what I was expecting to stumble into reporting this story, but, uh, yeah, it just, it was incredible to see how powerful these companies are in their various domains. Like the, str the struggle in blocking Google was that Google maps is so dominant in, in the mapping industry online. Like most websites, most apps rely on Google for mapping. And so when I blocked Google, it meant that my Uber and Lyft apps wouldn't work because I would try to, you know, open the app and put my address in and they just, um, um, I couldn't enter an address without Google maps. And it just surprised me that they kind of are operating, controlling something like 80% of the mapping tools around the web. Um, and they recently raised their prices and everyone was just freaking out because they'd all become so dependent on Google. Um, and now it was going to be really expensive and they realized they didn't have any alternatives. And I just kept running into that, um, seeing the way that the companies controlled various spheres. Um, and it, it, it didn't seem like maybe these companies have, have gotten, um, too much control over various industries through, you know, acquisitions and, um, and they just haven't, you know, faced any kind of pushback from regulators in the United States. Uh, the one everyone keeps talking about is just that Facebook was able to buy WhatsApp and Instagram and really controls now kind of the social network rails for a lot of people. When I went off Facebook, uh, I just had no way to mass communicate with my friends anymore beyond, you know, texting or emailing. And I would email people and no one would respond because no one uses email <laughs> anymore. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's been fascinating to see since that, since this series came out, you know, presidential candidates that are part of their platform is let's break up the tech companies. That is just a sea change in in how we're talking about dealing with these companies. It's really kind of wild um, from my perspective to see how uh, that antitrust drum is just getting louder and louder now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what, you know, here in the office, and I'm sure Joe over in CDT, you guys maybe have the, the daily conversation of what piece of consumer privacy technology is most terrifying. Um, <gasps> Uh, but we're yeah. tech optimists here at CDT, <laughs> and I think I think Maybe. Cashmere is supposed to be a privacy pragmatist. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then maybe it's just me because um, I would generally put the facial, but, you know, I, I jump between maybe facial scanning technologies or, you know, genetics, uh, you know, testing kits as being which which 
you know, pri consumer privacy technology am I most terrified of right now? Um, but I was wondering if, you know, in, at the end of the blocking the big five, you know, Alexa's back on in the house. Um, what are the issues that I guess uh, you see as the biggest risks for privacy or for consumer privacy right now? The biggest risk. I mean, it's, there's so many, it's so hard. <laughs> um, I mean, so the, the most powerful thing that happened for me over those, those weeks that I was off the technology was realizing what a, unhealthy relationship I had with the technology um, because I, I kind of, I went through a detox essentially, especially when it came to blocking them all because I discovered that, you know, Google, um, and I kind of knew this, but until I was actually trying to order a phone, it became, um, I didn't fully know it, but Google and Apple have a duopoly on the smartphone market such that I couldn't I couldn't get one, uh, and I had to go back to using um, a Nokia 3310, which was basically a dumb, dumb phone. Yeah, the brick, the famous, the famous brick. I had a bright orange one. It's like the size of my palm, <laughs> and had the snake game on it. That was everyone's first question when they saw <laughs> it in my hand. Absolutely, absolutely. I am in my mind playing snake right now. <laughs> oh man, and yeah, like, <laughs> good old times. T9 texting and snake. Yeah, absolutely. It was really funny. It had like a Facebook and a Twitter icon icon in the in the kind of con control screen but if you clicked on them it would just open you know twitter.com or facebook.com and this really basic and very slow <laughs> offer browser um maybe that's the secret <laughs> <laughs> and it was very frustrating for many reasons but it was also kind of great to only have a phone that made calls and texted. I mean, the texting was painful because it was T9 texting where you only have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to type with. Um, but, you know, I had before this, I was just in the habit of looking at my phone was the last thing I did at night most nights and it was the first thing I would do in the morning you know before I like touch, touched or talked to my husband or played with my daughter I would immediately just reach the nightstand and grab my phone and you know have the the that glow in the the mm -hmm. morning darkness and I realized during that week of the with the the dumb phone, I was like, I couldn't do that. And so I got out of the habit and I realized how much I hated it and just really how addicted I was to the phone and, you know, how I, I would watch TV and I'd be second screening on my phone and just always turning to it. And yeah, it, it really broke me of all those habits. Like I, for the first time in I, I don't know how long, like I turn off my phone every day at night around seven or eight, I turn it off and I don't turn it on until the next morning. Um, when I kind of start getting into work mode and so you I guess maintain the biggest... this? yeah, I have, re I have maintained it much to my husband's annoyance. He's like, you never know what time <laughs> it is anymore. I'm he's like texting me on the way home asking what he should pick up at the grocery store. And I just don't respond. And he's like, it's really annoying, but, um, but I, I feel a lot happier and like more present with my daughter and it, yeah, I've maintained it since then. And it really, I feel so much better. Um, and so the biggest revelation for me is, you know, Apple kind of, um, Apple, I think got off easy in the tech blocking weeks. It was like when I blocked Apple, they just didn't track me anymore, which was not the case for, for any of the other companies. Uh, and so they kind of lived up to their privacy promises. They're, they're making their money off of hardware and services. They're making money off their customers. They're not trying to track you when you're not using them. Um, but Apple has made, you know, devices, these smartphones that are so addictive and everyone else copied their design. And now we all are walking around staring at our phones and um, kind of just touching them all the time and having them on our bodies. And uh, I, uh, you know, my biggest takeaway was that like, that's really harmful um, on a lot of levels. And so, yeah, I guess that was my biggest takeaway from it. Like the biggest harm is how much we friggin' love touching and interacting with these devices. Serotonin every time you see the little red flag on Twitter, right? <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Lifehacker or Gizmodo piece that said that try to change the color scale? Oh, yeah. Color. I, I think that was a Tristan Harris advice. 
Can I ask what drew you to tech reporting? Um, initially, you were you were at uh, above the law, and certainly once upon a time back in like my law school days. Yeah, so I I basically got into journalism through writing it above the law. So I was writing in a very like voicey, funny way about um, you know lawyers and law school students and judges and legal matters. Um, and I went to journalism school while I was still working for Above the Law uh, to get a, a master's in magazine journalism. And I was in a program where they really um, they really encouraged you to develop a niche. And so I ended up focused on privacy there um, just because I, I came to journalism later in my life and I was kind of fascinated and horrified by how much I could learn about people when I was reporting on them and ab on above the law and yeah just how the internet was changing our privacy and um, and so yeah it was kind of on my mind so I developed this niche I called it the not so private parts and I was writing about all kinds of things that were happening in privacy and um, after above the law I went to work for Forbes and I named, they had like a very personal kind of setup. And so I had a page, it was called the not so private parts. And I was just kind of blogging all things privacy. And I was writing a lot about Facebook and legal cases about privacy. Um, but more and more, I kind of found myself writing about how cookie technology worked and how we were being tracked online. And all of a sudden people started putting me on, I thought of myself as a legal reporter, but people started putting me on like tech journalists you should be following. And so I realized that I, I somehow along the way I became like a, a technology reporter, but it wasn't, it wasn't by design. I kind of just backed into it because I was interested in privacy and technology is the biggest threat to privacy around. So I guess the sort of open-ended question that you can answer however you want is how is it reporting on those tech privacy issues at Gizmodo in particular? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so I am on an investigative team um, where we get to work on stories for months at a time. So I'm, I'm usually, you know, it, it, this Tech Giant series is a great example of, of what you're able to do when you have that kind of time to work on a story. Um, so I'm only writing a st story usually like a one per month or two or three per month, but I'm not kind of blogging every single day. Um, so that's a great, you know that's a great position to be in as a journalist. I just get to go really deep on things and, um, and yeah, do these kind of crazy projects that are um, really labor and time intensive and work with a technologist who I think just enhances the, the project a lot because it goes beyond what you can do as a journalist asking questions. You're really um, investigating how how the technology works and, and gathering data I usually wouldn't be able to gather on my own. So I really love it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I definitely did more frequent reporting and kind of like shorter stories in the past. Um, but this is great for, for where I am in my, my career and my interest. So yeah, it's been, it's been really, um, good opportunity to do, I think some of my best work really in the last couple of years. So as far as advice for sort of early career professionals, the aspirational listeners out there, I think you already hit on two sort of nuggets in this conversation already, the importance of trying to sort of find your niche or to find something that you can work on and be, you know, special in. And then also I think the importance of sort of working with other people outside of your area of expertise and whether it's technologists in your case or, you know, journalists, if you're a technologist, but I'd, I'd love to hear any other advice you might have, or, you know, if you could go back in time and tell younger Kashmir, you know, just do this or <laughs> here's some tips. Don't make this mistake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I th the niche thing has been really important and the working with a technologist has been something I only learned in the, the last few years. Um, I think um, I think one thing that people really like about my stories is that I mean a lot of times I just start from a place of curiosity like why is this thing the way it is um, like yeah well, what does Amazon learn about me when I use this credit card so so uh, the ability to focus what you're working on to really simple questions I think is is important especially for new reporters like sometimes you pursue something that's too um, too complicated. Um, so, so kind of like being able to recognize the kind of brilliance of simple questions, I think can be really helpful. Um, 
And, and yeah, trying to find something I've always tried to find in my reporting is real harms and real victims. Um, and I just think that that if you're specifically interested in this, like, you know, writing about tech policy, that just makes your writing so much more powerful. Um, so that when I was writing about Facebook's people, you may know, it's not just that it's like creepy that the company is sucking up all this information from, you know, everybody's contact books and then storing it and uh, creating like this vast black book of everybody who knows each other. It's that because they're doing that, they can connect sex workers to their clients, exposing those women's identities. Um, and that that's a real harm that comes from the practice. Uh, so I think like going that extra step of finding who is hurt by something, um, that that just makes these stories more resonant. Um, and so remembering that I think people like can theoretically be bothered by privacy issues, but you have to show them how it actually hurts people, um, and talk to those people and tell their life stories. And that's what can make the, make your audience really care about the issue. Absolutely. I, uh, I take a, as a as a would be privacy advocate, I sometimes look at some of the work that you're doing and, and other tech journalists, and I sometimes think that you guys are acting as a sort of a stronger agent of change than than folks like Emery and I are sometimes. Oftentimes, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that that's true, but I hope that our stories help in you guys' work. I cite them all the time in comments all over the place. It's yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, so Kashmir, I want to thank, I think that's just about all the time we have for today. I want to thank you so much for coming out here. Uh, perhaps you have time for m maybe one last question, a, a question that one of our readers has, or listeners has asked that we return to, which uh, is uh, asking what's on your bedside table? What, are you reading anything lately that you can recommend to our listeners? Uh, what am I, I've been reading, <laughs> well, I've been reading the Wheel of Time series. That's like something I started reading when I was doing the uh, tech blocking series and I've discovered that it's never ending. So I've been reading that yeah. ever since I then. Have, I have no idea how to get start. Which one do I start with? Uh, I can't even remember what the first one's called. They all have these like Path of Daggers and Crown of Thorns. <laughs> I don't know. It's ridiculous, but I was always like a fantasy sci-fi geek. Um, the other thing that I've been reading is The Age of Surveillance, um, which is by this Harvard business professor. And it's about kind of the development of um, – um, uh, the age of surveillance capitalism is called. It's uh, yeah, mm. just about the rise of data-based business um, uh, business models. And man, I have so many things on my shelf that I want to read. <laughs> uh, Physical Douglas. copies or Kindles? I do have a lot of Team Human by Douglas Rushkoff. I want to read next. Um, I. I'm still reading on the Kindle, but I I do love reading a physical book. I just, uh, yeah, I just hate killing more trees. Um, it's the only downside to reading physical books. Not in apartment sizes. All right, Kashmir, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a real pleasure, uh, a treat, uh, honestly, for me and Joe to get to talk to you. And I hope for our listeners as well. So thank you so much. My pleasure. This has been an episode of Tech Policy Grind, a podcast from the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. We're a collection of early career professionals paving the way in the tech policy world, and we really hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you just heard, it would be a huge help and mean a lot to us if you could head over to iTunes and leave a rating and a review. If you don't have iTunes, maybe just share the show with a friend. We want to thank Ali Sternberg for producing the intro and outro music for the show, and thank you all for listening. So, until next time, thanks. <laughs>